All right, so let's start the webinar. We do have a few people who are joining on Zoom. So. Recording in progress. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming again. I'm Kristen Shaw, the Deputy Health Officer for the Health Department. Kim McNamara, our Health Officer, will be joining us shortly. She had a meeting prior. And I wanted to just uh, reintroduce our health inspectors, Tony McClellan and Cameron Hersey. Uh, you've probably seen Tony in the field too. Cameron's new. You've all probably received the announcement that he joined us in February. So uh, we are here today to discuss uh, the uh, proposed amendments to our Chapter 4 Food Licensing and Regulations Ordinance for the Health Department. We are looking to update the food code this year. Our last update was in 2009, so it's been, it's been a while. So Cameron, if you want to just advance the slide. We're going to go and do it in three separate sections. Initially, I'm going to start with the food code itself, the 2022 version that came out at the end of December that, that, we're, that we're looking to update to. Then I'll talk briefly about Chapter 4 uh, amendments, which is Portsmouth specific. And do we have any food manufacturing folks here today, right now? The last couple slides are, are geared for their changes. Okay. And Kim McNamara, health officer, has just joined us. So go ahead and dance the slide. So as I just mentioned, we our last food code update was in 2009. The food code gets updated uh, every four years, generally. And it's the updates are brought together from consumers, from academics, from people in the industry themselves, and government. They get together biannually to address issues that um, they'd like to see changed or new science that's come out to support changing existing provisions in the food code. And you know, in the for this particular round, we have some examples of reasons why we do want to update. Uh, there's been changes to the world of allergen awareness. Sesame has been added as one of the major food allergens to be aware of. For packaged food, it came into effect from the federal government in January, January 1st. So you need to all be aware of that as a potential allergen when you're discussing it with customers, that that is something. If you're packaging food, there are labeling requirements now. Sesame needs to be included as an ingredient in that. Um, we see changes with the ch with COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, and the move to lots of outdoor dining. We saw a real big uptick in people wanting to have their dogs with them when they're dining outside. As you're probably all aware, we have allowed that in Portsmouth for several years now. Uh, as a previous amendment to the earlier code, we brought that in early before the conference picked it up and added a provision for it. We do have a dog. Um, patios variants that if you aren't aware of, if you are going to allow dogs on your patios, there is a variance process you would go through. There's no cost associated. Uh, you do ha there are some requirements for posting and some materials that you need to have on hand if you have dogs on the patio. Is that variance right online? It is. Okay. Yep. We sent out an email about it as well, so hopefully everybody was notified if you have a patio, it's specifically for people with patios. Uh, and on that note, it does not change the uh, requirements around service dogs. Service dogs always have priority on your patios uh, if there's any issues with dogs that are there. Your service dogs are allowed to stay, and the pet dogs would have to be asked to go. Um, and then I think this is a really great addition to the code. They have added um, availability for food donations. So about. Uh, a third of the food that's produced in the U.S. goes back into the garbage, and this is a way for us to not have that so much of that happen. So they've uh, put in provisions as long as you are handling the food correctly from uh, receiving through storage prep and donation. Donations are now allowed, which is a great thing for all of us. Let's go ahead and change. So I'm going to go through the the chapters of the food code one by one to show you what the uh, changes have been. Keep in mind these amendments are from the 2013, the 2017, and the, to the 2022. So what you're going to see are the amendments that have taken place in the last couple iterations of the food code that we haven't adopted. Adopting this code will serve two purposes for us. It'll keep us uh, consistent with the state so that we have there's consistency for people who operate in more than one location you're under the same set of regulations, as well as it's going to allow us to use inspectional software that will make us more efficient when we're in the field with you and conducting your audits. So chapter one is purposes and definitions. You can see here um, some of its vocabulary changing. Um, 
potentially hazardous foods, which you've heard us talk about over the years, is now time temperature control for safety, or TCS for short, and you'll see that referred to throughout the code. Uh, a lot of the definition changes are clarifications as well, or amendments, tobacco products. Uh, used to say tobacco, but we've added tobacco products because of e-cigarettes and everything surrounding those things. Those are still not allowed in restaurants. That a whole tobacco, anything with related to tobacco is still not allowed. Um, sesame as the allergen. They made some changes to shelf stock, which probably wouldn't affect most of you. Uh, it's to meet the shellfish uh, sanitation rules that are in place for people who are shell stock dealers already. It's to make the codes consistent between the shell stock program and the food code. Um, oh, yes, fruits and vegetables are now plant foods. They're just making that a more general uh, category for people. And also, one of the changes that I want to point out with this is this came out of commercially packaged products that come into you. I have to kind of pay attention to them to see if there's manufacturers cooking instructions on them. So a good example is frozen peas. If anybody has a salad bar and you're putting frozen peas out on that salad bar, some of the frozen peas that come in from commercially packaged establishments are not cooked. So they need to be cooked before they get put out for people. So they're not ready to eat. And there's been some uh, illness outbreaks of people not recognizing that because they're thinking about it. So they added a provision in the code to cover plant food that is ready to eat versus plant food that's not. Uh, OK, I think that's it for that slide. Any questions here? Do you want me to stop by slide for questions? Is there any more handouts? Um, yeah, that's just the highlights reel. So chapter two, management and personnel. The big change here that you probably saw in the email is that the updated code requires that your person in charge be serve safe certified or other some other type of food certification program. Most people do serve safe around here, but there are some others available. This is meant to be the person, it's not all your staff, it's, it's a person who's on duty while you're in operation if you're running an operation that does food prep and has practices of food prep. Uh, most people seem to have someone on staff that is. Uh, PIC, the person in charge, should be a manager, so this is not meant, again, for all your staff to get training, but we do have the op opportunity for folks to get all of the staff trained for food safety through UNH Cooperative Extension. They do a, a safe program. It is free. And we send emails out occasionally to let people know when those classes are happening. We'll continue to do that. I don't know if any of you remember, we used to offer the class here at City Hall. We hope to do that again in the future. And it's a two-hour class. There's a quiz at the end, and it's free. Uh, is that qualify for the certified food protection manager? No. It doesn't. No, okay. you need to take a test that is accredited you. for yeah. that. So yeah, so that's training to offer to the rest of your staff. So every, <laughs> you don't have to send everybody through a program. Uh, this this provision, uh, when if, this, if the code passes, is not going to be in place for you. You'd have to have someone in your facility by the end of September of next year. So through an, this, the rest of this permit year and the following permit year. Uh, serve safe. Uh, the associate level, is that adequate, or is it to serve safe manager? It's manager, and it's the only one that they actually are offering currently. Oh, okay. I put my associates through an online serve safe. Uh, and then is it during yeah. all hours of operation, someone needs to be on property that's serve safe? Yes, if you, have a if you have a facility um, that where you're prepping and preparing the food, yes. So like the um, CVSs of the world, obviously, no. Okay. But Great. for, yes, a restaurant, yeah, you would want to have somebody there who can answer the questions. Actually be responsible for having active managerial control of the environment and then to address any problems that arise. And they also need to be familiar with foodborne uh, illness transmission and how to deal with employees that are calling in to make sure that they do need to be excluded. That's okay. part of the responsibilities for this. Oh, yes, that's right. And just uh, keep in mind, ServeSafe uh, is good for five years, the certification. So if you're sending someone through it, it's not a, an annual thing. They will have certification for five years. So, uh, And, and we do have a class too? locally. I'm sorry, Donnie. There is a, a company that comes to Portsmouth monthly that teaches the class at a hotel. Um, and it's posted online for, for that. Is the ServeSafe manager good for two years? No, five. Five. Okay. Five years, yeah. So, um, so I represent common table from St. John's Church that's a charitable. Oh, yeah. How does that affect them? Do they have to have someone certified? 
Uh, probably not currently you, because of what you're doing in there, but that's a good question. It wouldn't hurt for them to go through the SAFE program, which they have in the past. What do you mean for your community? Uh, yeah, right they serve food every, uh, to about 50 to 175 people weekly on Thursdays. Right, and I understand that's a mixture of, of, of different Yeah, people. certain restaurants in Portsmouth that right. I think we would probably be exempt if it's a problem. Okay. We would love to try to find a way to get someone or your staff cert safe certified, but as being a church and you're essentially running what is sometimes called a soup kitchen, mm -hmm. even though it's much more yeah. flavorful, um, I think you would be exempt. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. could get that to safe program to them. But yes, at the same certain. time, we want to be safe by yeah. following all of the regulations. Certainly, and, yeah. and you do a good job with that. And we also can offer some of that education ourselves. Anybody else? Um, again, you're going to see any time in the code they make an adjustment to a definition, any place that that shows up again, there's an amendment for it. So tobacco products is going to be on a lot of these slides because it's mentioned in several different places in terms of hand washing, uh, designated areas for employees where they can and can't do it. So where the repeated amendment is to just change the code where, it, where the wording changed. Um, Oh, so yeah, uh, non-typhoidal salmonella was added as reportable, which means if you have a staff member that comes tells tells you that they were diagnosed with this, they can't work until they're cleared. Um, that's responsible for a million uh, incidents of diarrheal illness annually. So it's a it's a biggie, and it hasn't changed much. We've seen some reduction in other foodborne illnesses over the course of the last several years, except for this particular salmonella. Okay, so the uh, PIC is also responsible for monitoring food temps, hot and cold, and thawing. This is a, a newer provision because uh, we see lots of issues with people not thawing food appropriately and using hot water, which is not actually something you should do because it allows bacteria to grow faster in that environment. Um, the push for having a person in charge certified is so that you, you can have active managerial control of your environment, which means being proactive on site yourselves rather than reactive to us coming in on inspection. We're, we, we come in as, as your partner in food safety to be your fresh eyes, to show you the things that might you might be missing out on. The PIC in management's role is to actively pursue that same thing so that everything goes, goes smoothly and we can avoid potential foodborne illnesses. Um, uh, this last one, the written requirements for uh, vomit and diarrheal events in your establishment. I know it's not fun to think about. It happens in restaurants, so you do need to have some sort of written procedure for your staff to follow, and cl cleaning materials available for that purpose if it happens uh, in your establishment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, I have three slides about food. There are a lot of amendments in this section, so. Um, uh, We'll go through them really quickly. Oh, okay, let's see. The food donation shows up in this part. Again, you're going to see that several times because of it being new, so it, it fits in several areas. Uh, wild mushrooms, the state's working on a program for that to be available to us, uh, people for identification purposes for wild mushrooms specifically. Um, so stay tuned. There'll be more information about that coming down the pike. Um, Donation is covered, as I said, safety provisions for beginning to end for food donations to be allowed from your establishment to soup kitchens, food pantries. Uh, they added some clarification on napkins. So for those of you that serve rolls and line your baskets, you can line it with linen, it's okay. Uh, it's only good for drier foods like rolls. Uh, maybe muffins or croissants or something like that. It's not meant to be used with wet food product because that will allow. It can actually be a, a fomite surface for pathogens to grow on. So that is clarifications in that section. Um, there's this new provision regarding uh, refilling returnables. So if you have food that you're offering for takeout and it's, and it's in a container that is possibly reusable, there's a provision for that to happen now. Uh, there's some requirements for your staff for what they need to look for. 
the containers have to come from your facility. I'm not exactly sure how that would play out in real life for you, for what that would look like for what you're purchasing. Um, but that is now a new provision that would be allowed with the passage of this. So people could bring them back, your staff. <coughs> we see the refillables mostly with growlers in the breweries, and they have a system set up for washer and sanitize of the growler before it gets refilled. Or you think of um, if you have uh, drink service, coffee mugs, people coming with their own. Th those things are, have already been allowed. This is to allow uh, reusables of other types if they meet the provisions and they come from you. So I don't have a good example for what that might look like for a food product yet, but any questions for this slide? Okay. Oh, so the First Amendment on this page just makes me laugh. So the, in the 2017 food code, they realized they, they left off a designation. So when you, we come on inspection, you hear about there's three different types of violations, priority, Priority foundation and core priorities are the things that directly contribute to foodborne illness. Priority foundations are indirect contributors. They support or enhance the other ones. Um, you're not allowed to store food or uh, any other things in toilet rooms. You never have been. It's actually a higher risk of contamination in those environments than uh, in other environments. And they left the designation off in the 2017, which is why it appears now as an amendment for 2022, because they put it back. Um, you'll see that in a couple places in here. Uh, earlier in the definitions, they clarified uh, intact meat versus non-intact meat, and that's for temperature requirements. So whole, whole meat cuts versus anything that's um, ground, ground up or whatever. And so uh, again, that is because they changed the definition with clarification it's appearing. Oh, yeah. Uh, going back to the... Uh to the toilet rooms. Yep. Uh, that's that pertains only to food. Uh, uh, single service, uh, like, like plastic silverware, single use items, take out yep. containers. Nothing food related can be stored in a toilet room. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, in cabinetry that you're putting stuff in, just nothing. Just keep it out of the keep it out of the bathrooms, please. But backup uh, TP or or that's paper okay. towels down below, something like that's that. That's okay. Yeah, okay. Just All nothing right. nothing food. Nothing okay. food or equipment utensil type related can be stored in, in those rooms. Um, so if anyone's engaging in non-continuous cooking practices, um, you have to have written procedures and, and show them to us. I don't know if anybody uses this. Um, mostly this is, seems to be done with people preparing for can like banquet catering. If you're going to partially cook something and then hold it to cook it later, maybe put uh, grill marks on uh, chicken wings for service. To, you know, you're going to big service after. So you're, you're starting the cooking process and then bringing it back out. You do need written procedures for that, so you do need to let us know that, that you are practicing that. We have a little form for it. Uh, and obviously, t your time and temp requirements depend on what you're doing it with. So. Um, The cooking instructions for manufactured foods, again, goes back to that P example I gave you with ready-to-eat product, just to make sure if you're, if you're opening up a commercially processed package of food, if it has cooking instructions that you adhere to that, it's not ready to eat at the, in, until it's cooked. Um, I don't think that there are many people in here. I don't know that we have anybody with shop scale, scallops in. I, I have a question about the uh, fruits and vegetables replaced with plant foods. Yep. Can you give us an example of a plant food that is not a fruit and vegetable? No, that's it. They just changed it. Instead of writing fruits and vegetables everywhere, they went with plant foods. Beyond meat? Just. Is that would be beyond meat be I don't know a what they would food? categorize that at plant food, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they didn't clarify it down to that level, just that they changed the vocabulary. Okay. For fruits and veg. Um, any questions about anything up there? Um, so we, we do a lot of banquet, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I do like a lot of marking and then holding. So is that a form that I can just like get online? I can send it to you. I don't yes. need a HACCP form, though. Can we have one, too? Yeah. yeah, can you email me? Yes. Yeah, my email's in the stuff I sent you yesterday. You can contact me, Cam Shaw, okay. at Safe Force with Yes, and I'll get that to you then, so you can get that to us. You, do I need to hold temp logs on that, too? Um, probably a good idea. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Just record good be, recording practice. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, you don't need to necessarily save them for any length of time like you would with your shellfish tags, but if you're going to do the written, the, you, we have to write out your procedure. Like once the event's gone and yeah. we know that. And, and no you can issue. repeat it. You don't have to do it for each event for us. So this is the this is how you're handling this for this type of event. If you're okay. making a ton of chicken and doing this, this is the process. We have to check the temp the timing. Okay. How you're doing it, and then it's on file. I'll definitely side fire with you. Yeah. Can I be sure I heard that correctly? You're saying they don't have to do it every time there's a new event, just for the process. The process. Yeah. We, and then you have keep that on site so that records are available when we come in to inspect. Okay. We'll we'll put it down. We'll list it almost. You're not getting a a variance necessarily. Um, if someone has a HACCP plan, we do HACCP inspection for the process that they're doing. Generally, it's reduced oxygen packaging for the few people that have them, or acidified rice for sushi. So, if we come to a restaurant that um, makes sushi, but isn't they haven't they're not making the rice when we're there, we'll come and do a separate HACCP inspection for it. This is a record keeping thing. You have to be keeping the records for being able to do this procedure. Yep. Um, we want to know that you're doing it. So we'll be checking. It's a record check for us on inspection for okay. that process. So if, if you've done it, we'll ask you, are you doing this? Can we see records kind of thing? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's new. So that's not in place and this list code is adopted. It's a provision that we have yet. Okay. I mean, so, I just, um, about it, so we have second reading of the ordinance change on June 20th. June 20th. Okay. Uh, they could do second and third readings. That's public session that night as well for when city council looks at this again. <laughs> um, it, either they'll do a second and third or we'll go to a third reading and that would be in July, the next one. And then we'll send everybody an email if, if the city council adopts this so that you're aware that this has been passed. Um, okay, I think we're going to the next slide. All right, so for those of you that aren't aware, if you're getting fish that's uh, cryovac'd, um, you want to be sure your staff knows if they're taking that out to thought, cut it before you thought. Uh, it's been shown that it can actually still grow. Uh, uh, CBOT will still grow, so botulism is a potential outcome when you thought in the ROP without it being open to the environment because um, CBOT is anaerobic, loves that environment. They have been printing that on um, boxes and of fish that come in that way, so you probably have already heard about that, but not all the staff's aware of it, so just let people know they're going to thaw fish for you. Either take it completely out of the package or at least slit the package open when they're, um, when they're thawing. Uh, uh, some clarifying language for <coughs> date marking exemptions. If you have shelf stable dry sausages, they don't need date marking. A lot of commercially prepared products like deli salads don't require date marking. It's that seven day mark we have you put on foods that you prepare for when you need to get rid of it commercially prepared products, there's exemptions to that, and that's what some clarifying language was added for. Uh, the addition for time as a control for safety. So if you're going to not be using temperature to control for safety for a food product, we see it mostly with our pizza places, making pizzas to have out to sell by the slice. They don't necessarily keep them under temperature control, they're just at room temp. They actually have approval to use time as a control. So they. The clock starts ticking for them. They have four hours to use for pizza slices to be out of temp. They have to discard them at the end. That's just an example of it. What the clarifying language here is to let people know that if you're using time as a control for other things, if you're using a product that's like a fresh produce, I'm just going to use tomatoes for an example. The tomatoes don't have to be cool to 41 to then be then to be held at room temperature. It starts at room temp, 70 degrees. The clock we'll start at that point for it. So it's some clarifying language. Same with anything that's commercially processed. If you open up a can of something that's shelf stable, you don't have to bring it down to 41 and then start the clock. It just 70 degrees is okay. So that's the clarifying language in that part of the code. Um, there's been there's several little sections in here that have to do with reduced oxygen packaging changes or uh, to <coughs> how people go about and do that. Um, we already have requirements in place for HACCP plans for people who are ROPing. Depending on the product, you might need to send it for a process review with a food science uh, facility. Um, and it requires, they all require variances in Portsmouth. So if you are planning on doing something that's reduced oxygen packaging, reach out to me and I'll walk you through the process for how to do that. There's record keeping involved in training of staff and we can go through that whole thing. 
When you give the um, degrees, could you give both the <laughs> the Fahrenheit as well as the, because I don't know the Celsius and the Fahrenheit, so please say both when you refer to I don't to have, them. I only put Fahrenheit on my slides. Oh, you put Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, I should have. They should all be Fahrenheit. So you They're would like Fahrenheit. them in Celsius as well? I took the Celsius off because most you people don't Celsius. want it. Celsius. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Because uh, some, uh, uh, some machines only have Celsius, and some, depending on if they're European. Yeah. Or if they're yeah. In the, in the codes, it goes both ways. For this presentation, I just use oh, Fahrenheit. Okay. That's yeah. fine. But I can, I can add it. Um, again, more ROP information. Uh, one of the, with the allergen changes, besides adding sesame, they added some changes to labeling requirements. Um, if you have bulk food products that you offer, uh, again, I'm gonna use the salad bar as an example. If you had, if you have an allergen out on your salad bar, you should post above the item that is an allergen so that people are aware of it. Um, and they want it in writing. That's just a label somewhere. So if you have, um, I can't think of a good example, walnuts, I guess. You know, you want to let people know that is there in writing, so that anybody who does have an allergy to that product, it's easily identifiable for them. Uh, if you self dispense stuff, it's really that's more of a grocery store thing with the um, dispensers of like nuts and stuff, grains. Okay. Any questions on this section? Okay, chapter four. Moving on to equipment. Um, so they added a provision that you have to always have, make sure that you have cleaning agents, so detergent and sanitizer on site. I mean, you should anyway, but it's now actually they added that to the code. Um, sanitizer's always been there. The rich detergent one is, the, is a bit of a change. So everybody needs to know where they are, too. When we come in on inspection, if your dishwasher is empty of detergent and the alarm's going off and we point it out, somebody should know where to go get that and fix that for you. Hopefully that won't happen, though, because you'll all have control of the environment. So um, again, another revision to this is the cabinet piece of what we were talking about earlier for don't store stuff in the restrooms. Did you have a question? OK. Um, so they amended the food code. I think this came in, this was a 2017 amendment that um, if you're using equipment that is being used with a, uh, an allergen like a fish, that you want to clean and sanitize it in between moving to a meat product. You used to be able to go by temperature. So you could start with your, your raw item that gets cooked to the lowest temperature and move through. And they adjusted it for allergen purposes that if, you, if you're doing something with fish, clean and sanitize the equipment in between you before starting with the meat after. Mm, yeah. Or vice versa. Uh, and again, another change because they left off the, the designation and the food code for that. Do you have any? Now we're going to burn through. There weren't many amendments to the next three chapters of the food code, which is great. So for plumbing, this is a new one for 2022. Again, when they make the food code updates, they try to make things as consistent as they can. So they adjusted the hand sink temperature down to 85 as the minimum amount. It was 100. This is for the International Plumbing Code because your hand sinks have to have tempered water at it. And the tempered water range in the plumbing code that the plumbers everywhere are having people do is 85 <coughs> to 110. So they just made our, our code compliant with what the rest of the folks out there are doing. Um, we want to encourage hand washing, say the minimum you want it to be would be 85. 100 is nicer for, for temp, for actually keeping people washing their hands. But the temperature itself is uh, not what's helping with hand washing. It's the action of, of rubbing your hands together with soap. Uh, so chapter six, physical facilities. Again, the, t the tobacco products. This has to do with designated areas for where employees eat, drink, and smoke. That's the update. Um, the next provision is the outdoor uh, patio dining areas for dogs that I talked about briefly before. This was, again, already in the Portsmouth amendments. So this is just the food code adding it in. And as I mentioned, you just have to do a variance here for that. And it is seasonal. So you, each year, somebody will be reapplying for it. Everything is online for that, so it will be a renewal for you for that if you allow dogs on your patios in the future. Uh, chapter 7, uh, 
uh, apparently they must have had some issues with people using chemical storage containers that they finished with uh, putting other things like equipment and food in them after they were used for chemical toxics. Don't do that. So this is the code catching up to please don't do that. It should not have food in it after the fact. If it had, I don't know, paint in it first, don't use it for food or equipment. Um, and then they, there's a, if, a chemical wash provision for fruits and vegetables that if you are using one, it has to be listed um, with the Environmental Protection Agency has a, a list of what's appropriate. Also the Code of Federal Re Regulation speaks to that. There's test kits that are, are required for it as well. And that's what that provision is for. If you're going to do it, you have to be able to ensure the concentration is correct, like you do with your sanitizers. Anybody have any questions? <coughs> Okay, uh, compliance and enforcement chapter. Um, so again, the beginning of this, you can see this first provision is to include food donations in the protection of public health. And that's why it is was added here. Uh, a lot of ROP um, provisions follow that. This is all part of HACCP. If you are conducting a special process, you're already, you're already following almost all of these because we had them built in previously to HACCP, and it's updates to in what information needs to be included in the plan for it. Um, we do have a new provision in this code that you're, you probably are all aware that your inspection records are public record and people can request them at any time. Um, they can request them of the health department. They can also request them of you. So you do need to have someone who knows where your copy of your latest inspection is in case someone asks you. They have, the public has a right to ask you to see your inspection data. Uh, uh, RA on here is regulatory authority, also known as us. Um, <coughs> the second to last amendment up there is that we, it's a provision for the health department so that we actually are able to continue to pursue training so that we stay up to date on all the changes in your world as well. The, the, retail food environment has changed so much in all the years I've been doing this. Some of the things that you do in your restaurants are so creative and we have to be taught about them as well along the way because we're not all chefs. Um, and so we understand what might, what safety issues could arise from something that you might be doing in your facility and help you avoid any issues associated with that. And then this other provision, we kind of had this in place already with your emergency response plans that you should all have for something goes wrong in your establishment. Um, they add in an exception that would allow us to allow you to still operate in cer certain circumstances of power outages. If we had a, uh, an ice storm again that goes on for too long, that if you have written procedures for how you're gonna operate your facility during that time frame, that we can approve those for you. It allows us the option to approve those. They do have to be approved from the health department. Any questions on chapter eight? Yep. I assume what you just talked about would be overruled by any fire codes, right? Would be what? <laughs> the operations during power outages would be overruled by any fire codes, right? Or in, at least in conjunction with, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. If there's a fire, get out. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. No, I mean, sometimes you need, like, your exhaust hoods on, things like that. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah, that, yes, good point. Um, okay, so we can move on those. So now we're moving into, this is chapter four, that's our actual food code lives here in Portsmouth in chapter four of the city ordinances. We have, when we make any changes, they have to be adjusted as well in the records here. Um, how city council looks at these things is um, when you're making a change to something that exists, it's, you turn it red and then you strike it out if you're removing it. So I condensed down, I didn't put all of the stuff that already exists in this, just so I could show you what the highlights are that we're asking them for changes to. Anywhere in our existing ordinances says 20, 2009 had to change to red to say 2022, because we're changing to the code. So every reference to the 20, 2009 code has been changed to red um, in the code. And it's reflected through chapter four. Uh, we have very little in the way of amendments at, to add this time. Uh, this first amendment is a, a typographical error that we had the wrong uh, sized B. So the first uh, 112, 110 is simply an editorial correction for us. The next thing down the drain board subsection, our um, plan review process has been always that we have dual drain boards 
requirements for three bay sinks. So when people open up and they're putting in their three bay, they have to have uh, drain boards on either side. They're integral to the piece of equipment. Um, the food code doesn't call out the dual drain boards, but our, our um, plan review, which is where that gets picked up, uh, would pick that up. So we're just memorializing that with this addition, the word dual. The next one down that's uh, um, crossed out is because it, we had added it in 2009. By the time we got the, it in front of city council, the supplement to, a supplement to the food code had come out with that provision in it for the future food code. So we grabbed it because uh, we wanted to be able to have people to be able to test their hot water dishwashers. Like anyone who uses low temp uses the chemical test kit. If you have a hot water sanitizing dishwasher using either stickers that are heat heat labels or um, perhaps you have a plate, a, a thermometer that is waterproof that you send through. Um, we've been looking for it for years on your inspection, so that's not news to anybody. The 2022 has that incorporated in it because it was brought in in 2013. So this is to remove it from our local amendments because it exists in the food code, so we don't need it. Uh, <laughs> the next one down is also another vocabulary change. It was supposed to say or. Last time it went in with and, so we are switching it back to or, so the sentence makes sense for, uh, for our, our local amendment. I'd like to add, I've gotten a few questions about the drain boards, the dual drain boards on your three bay sinks. There are some operations that were approved with only one drain board because of space requirements, or perhaps you were doing less food handling at the time and maybe have created uh, or Im Im improved your food handling. It's the wrong word. Increased your food handling. Nobody who is currently operating needs to change their three bay because of this. This is, as Kristen says, so that the architects and people who are designing kitchens know that's a requirement and they'll put it in so we'll see it on plan. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. So this is the definition section. Um, when we did our last food code update, this most of what you're going to see in the next couple slides applies to our food processing plants that we have in town. It really doesn't apply, these don't really apply to the people who are here today. I'm not sure who's online with us right now. Uh, so if anybody's watching, the definitions that live in the food code don't apply to food manufacturers because they don't adhere to the food code. They adhere to the Code of Federal Regulation. So we have to have the, um, the definitions adopted locally so that they actually work with their ordinances or their regulations, excuse me. So all of these definitions, almost all of them, have to do with the food manufacturers. Uh, and then we caught up with the state because we did, last time we did this retail food store uh, and mobile food unit uh, did not get updated when they were supposed to be updated. So we didn't have them in the right way last time. Um, and again, we have the food code changed because we're changing from 09, hopefully, to 2022. So the definitions match. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Trade secrets and confidentiality, again, mostly meant for the food processing <coughs> plants. This does apply to you in the second paragraph. If we have somebody with, that we take consumer complaint from, we protect that information uh, if, when we can uh, for health purposes. Um, and if you are doing something that would be considered a trade secret and, you're, and we are in on inspection, this is what covers that too. Uh, maybe an ROP thing would apply if there's some special recipe. We don't tend to look at your recipes. That's not what we do for inspections. That doesn't, it's really more for the manufacturers. And then the next couple sections are specific to food manufacturing and it's how, they, how their inspection, um, uh, inspection reports sort of work. Uh, we give you, in retail, you're given time frames from the inspectors for correction. This is their corrective action plans. And you can go ahead and advance. I'm not going to read through them because it doesn't apply to anybody who's with us currently. Uh, but you can see them online if you're curious what they have to do. It's, it's pretty much the same. Um, and then the very last page, we're at the last slide, is because we had to update our temporary event uh, <coughs> language in the local or ordinance. That's the change in red, that it, temporary events only go for three days at max here. So, and that covers it. So those are all of the changes we brought forth, and we hoped, again, to go to the 2022 food code so that we can uh, catch up with people and also uh, take advantage of better inspectional software that's out there for us to use in the field. Uh, does anybody in the room have any questions before I open it up to anybody on Zoom? 
guess my one question would be the um, pick. You said there's a person there's gonna in charge. Yep, yeah, there's going to be a test for that. That's something that the city will. No, so for a person in charge, that's a serve safe. It, it, okay, that yep, is that's serve the safe. Test. Okay, I, um, I guess I misunderstood. Yeah. Yep, so certified food protection managers will take a test. That's how how they meet the requirement for that. Right. Okay. Um, we have a, we used to offer a safe class, and UNH is still offering the safe class. When we offer it here, we had a quiz that went with it for a food handler card. We'd like to bring that back in the future. We hope to do that. That's still our goal. And it will. we offer it at different times during the, during the year when we bring it back. It's held here in city uh, council chambers. It's about two hours, about a two-hour class. And we'll, it, we'll like, give you plenty of notice. We try to hold it at different times of the day when we do it. So if, you have, if you're a more of an evening establishment, you can get people here in the morning. If you're a morning establishment, there's an afternoon session so we can get people in. And if there are other language speakers in your restaurants or your food service establishments, just let us know and we'll try to make accommodations for them to help with the test or even the mm -hmm. instruction. Yeah, sure. oh, and, and that's true for ServeSafe. ServeSafe, um, Tony, can you tell us what's available? What did you hear from HR Food Safe about? They have Spanish and? Yes, um, several languages Spanish, French, um, Thai, I think. There's, there's several of the most yeah. common. So it, just in case, if we can help you find mm -hmm. find that. For and there folks. are others, aren't there, that qualify for a, a manager to be certified yep. other than ServeSafe? Yeah, that's just the that's more the most common, common one people one. do. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a list out there of places. So it's a certified food protection manager is what you're looking for. Okay. Some people have it as a designation <laughs> uh, that's not a ServeSafe version and it lasts longer. They have to do continuing education to keep it. So maybe some chefs may have that from school. Uh, is there anybody on, online with questions? We'd be happy to answer them. So there's two people. Um, I believe they have if you could just raise your hand if you're, if you're on Zoom and have any questions, we're happy to answer. Nothing yet? Okay, so I guess that's it. If no one has any questions, there will be, a, um, again, the city council meeting for the second reading for the ordinance change is June 20th, 6 o'clock. Oh, I believe I'll so. post it on our web page. I'll, po I'll post it on the chat. Maybe I can, I'll do a blast email out again to let people know in case you're interested in attending. Um, it will be here in, in city council chambers. Are there any comments, not necessarily questions, but are there any comments anyone would like to make? And please feel free to reach out to me again if you if you think of something after you want me to clarify for you and I will get the slides put up on the health department web page so that if you want to review or share them with anybody that thank might be interested. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all thank for coming you. today. Thank you. I'm going to end the webinar. I do just have to switch.